What I'm really excited about at the moment is the breaking down of barriers and like the emergence of these new relationships and partnerships between companies that previously were competitors and, you know, now they're emerging maybe a bit more as frenemies. Uh, so you've got these different partnerships taking place, making it that advertisers are getting what they want, viewers are getting what they want, but also both the businesses through this partnership are able to grow. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Identity Architects, the InfoSum podcast that spotlights the leaders in the media industry shaping the future of data-driven advertising. One of the UK's largest broadcasters, Channel 4, is an organization that has pioneered the use of data cleanrooms and data collaboration across the CTV space. And at the forefront of that work since day one has been our guest today, Alex Wright, programmatic and platform leader at Channel 4. Together, Alex and I discuss the current state of CTV, the innovative solutions Channel 4 has launched in recent years, its ambitious fast-forward strategy, and much, much more. Before we jump into that conversation, this is your reminder to hit that subscribe button so you'll always be the first to know when the latest episodes of Identity Architects drop. But without any further delay, here's my chat with Alex. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by one of my favorite people in the media industry, Alex Wright, programmatic and platform leader at Channel 4. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. That was a very nice intro. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. Uh, For anyone who doesn't know you the way that I do, can you just give us a quick introduction to yourself and also because we have an international audience to Channel 4? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Alex Wright. And as you said, I'm the programmatic and platform leader at Channel 4. My team looks after the evolution of the Channel 4 programmatic offering, as well as to launch and develop our data fueled products such as brand match and retail. Uh, Channel 4 is a UK uh, public service broadcaster and the channel is publicly owned, but fully funded by advertising and currently has 30 million registered users on its VOD platform, Channel 4 Streaming. Amazing. I think we've got tons to cover uh, and it should be a really, really great episode. But we'll start the way we always do and we're going to kick off with our quick fire questions to get to know you a little bit better. Okay. Starting with what is your earliest memory of advertising? Um, I love this question. My earliest memories of advertising were definitely those of television advertising. Um, I grew up in Australia in the 1980s and most of the brand messages um, had messages about both being kind of Australian and also being healthy and safe. So, uh, for example, my favorite cereal, the ambassadors were always triathletes or like um, Ironmen, Olympic swimmers, that kind of thing. Then there was a lot of public service messaging about being a good citizen. So do the right thing, put it in the bin, don't drink and drive, what to do if you're caught in a fire. So those were my earliest memories and they definitely all were television advertising. Yeah, that's amazing. It's incredible how often we ask that question. I'd say nine times out of 10, the answer is TV. And it's those mm-hmm. memories and those adverts that really do stand with people are those kind of, especially this kind of old school TV ads. So that's that's awesome. So if you take your back, self back to that, um, what did you want to be when you were growing up? So when I was really young, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. And then from the age of about 10 onwards, I wanted to be either a writer or an archaeologist. Wow, that's incredible. That's uh, that's quite the eclectic collection of... Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. So then obviously with that not uh, working out, with not becoming a ballerina, what, uh, what was your first job in either advertising or marketing or media? Uh, so my first job in advertising was working at News in Australia, so Murdoch in Australia. Uh, I worked on the national newspaper, which is a broadsheet called The Australian, and I was on the agency team working with agencies on their print media campaigns. So that was my first job, actually, straight in there. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Straight into the industry. What yeah. do you think it was about the industry that drew you in then? And what do you think keeps you in it to this day? So when I initially explored my passion of being a writer or a journalist, I realized fairly quickly that it was a highly competitive environment and the internships available were few and far between and often unpaid for up to two years. Uh, And that just wasn't going to work for me. So then I realized I could still actually work in the industry I love, which is media, but I could actually do it in another part of the the industry, which is media sales, and actually get paid for it. So that's why I, I started working in media sales. And why I'm still in it is because I just love the fact that it's so dynamic and ever-changing, uh, especially in recent times with digital and social and data. It just keeps moving and changing. It really keeps me on, on my toes, and I really like that. 
Yeah, I love that. It's, it's a rapidly evolving space and I think it keeps things very interesting. So yeah, I completely agree with that. So you must get uh, to speak to a lot of people at various stages of their career. So what advice would you give to someone who is maybe just starting out in the media and advertising industry? Again, I really like this question. So I think the advice I would give is to keep your eye on the future and what is the next big thing? So what the next big thing in, is has evolved so much over the years. It was digital display. Then it was the, you know, the year of mobile. Then it was programmatic and then video. And now CTV and data. And if you keep your eye on the fastest growing parts of the industry and you have a curiosity for that, then there'll always be opportunities because as those parts of the industry um, emerge and become the next big thing, they're going to need skilled workers to help it grow and that's where the opportunities lie. That's what I've always found. If you, The advice I've got, if you're already in a job in a company but you are interested in another part of the company or another you know, area of the business, then reach out to some of your colleagues or people you might not even know yet who already work in that side of the business and just ask them if you can have an hour of their time to catch up. I did that when I was moving into programmatic and you'll be surprised at how open people are to actually giving you some of their time and sharing some of their advice and their experience with you. And it really helps to, you know, to, helps you decide whether that's what you want to do. And lastly, I've always had really lovely recruiters who have helped me have amazing, you know, find amazing new jobs. Um, so they're often the gateway into opportunities and roles so that that you wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to. So definitely keep a nice network of, of recruiters around you as well, I think. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. And you mentioned how rapidly evolving our industry is and therefore it can be an incredibly complex uh, industry to work in. How would you describe what you do within media and advertising to, say, a 10-year-old? Uh, this, this is really actually quite difficult. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I think I would choose, uh, firstly, I would choose to align it with something that they're familiar with. So either I think television is a good place to start or something they might be accessing, say, YouTube Kids or whatever content they're consuming. And I would explain the ads that run around them and how those ads are helping these companies to sell products so that... Um, these companies can make more products and then also that as a sort of value exchange that the money from those products and those companies you know advertising around the content these platforms like television or YouTube kids can create more of the shows that the child loves so anything from bluey to ninja kids or whatever the big thing that the, the 10 year old is watching at the time something football related uh, then you know just explaining that value exchange and but maybe aligning it with something that they actually value themselves yeah i think that's a great way to describe what we do um yeah we obviously as we mentioned it's a it's a complex industry and there's a lot going on um but every time i see you at events or around you've always got a massive smile on your face and you always seem super motivated and passionate about what you're doing what inspires you and keeps you motivated i definitely think anything that's new so new challenges and adventures i love exploring new things in life and work so from discovering a new book or a tv show to traveling to new places and overcoming challenges there to then also launching a new product or an initiative in my work and overcoming challenges there as well so anything yeah i'm really driven by by new things and new challenges I love that. Definitely the industry for you then, as we've touched on it. It changes a lot. So there's lots of new challenges that come up. The last of our quick fire questions and a personal favorite of mine, because it always gives me a little bit of a unique insight into every person I get to speak to on this podcast. If there was a song that was a soundtrack to your life, what would it be? Yeah, so I really don't like this question. It's too difficult to answer with one song. Uh, so I love The Beach. So if I had to choose one song, it would be something I would listen to on the beach, something like the Beach Boys or Bob Marley or something I can really chill out and relax to. So that would be my answer. I love that. They're great, great artists. So yeah, I completely agree with those. Uh, so moving on to some of the more topic related questions and obviously Info Summer Channel 4 have been working together for a number of years now. Uh, we worked together back in 2020 when Channel 4 launched Brand Match, uh, its solution for using first party data to deliver advertising across the Channel 4 audience. And in fact, you were the first speaker at an event we ran, which was a precursor to our Info Summits back in March 2020, before we all suddenly went into lockdown just a few weeks later. But since then, can you give, give us an overview of that solution and how it's evolved over the last few years? Yeah, absolutely. And has evolved 
in so many ways. Uh, we it was we were so excited to launch this uh, product with InfoSum uh, using a data clean room for the first time. So what the product was was that we um, we realised that we had thirty million registered users and uh, all of the registration details and all of their behaviours on our platform. You know we had all of that information uh, and using um, a data clean room, we invited advertisers to bring their own first party data to match with our thirty million users so that they could target their customers on our platform. So that's what Brand Match was when we launched it and uh, how it has evolved it was really on how we've really fine-tuned that offering the offering is still the same as what we launched back in March uh, 2020 but we really streamlined things like our timelines we brought it back from you know it could be a couple of months down to now a couple of weeks to turn around a campaign uh, we streamlined the legal requirements the paperwork we worked with InfoSum to really help advertisers understand that process is not as challenging as some people thought it might be um, we understood what minimum data sizes were were that we needed to work with data sets um, sizes. We launched a measurement solution after post campaign using the same data clean room. So it has evolved in many different ways. And then the success of Brand Match has paved the way for our even more successful product launch since then, which is retail. Uh, retail offers FMCG clients who often didn't have their own first party data access to shopper segments from some of the UK's biggest UK retailers like Nectar, Tesco and Boots for both targeting and measurement via InfoSom. So a lot going on and a lot of development since my, that, that day back in March 2020. That's fantastic. I mean, it was truly such a, an exciting time and it was kind of a revolutionary product. Um, and obviously Channel 4 continues to revolutionize uh, everything you're doing in the industry. And I guess one of the ways that you are revolutionizing uh, the way that Channel 4 works is earlier this year, you announced Fast Forward, uh, a strategy to transform Channel 4 into a digital first public service center. Can you give us an overview of that strategy and explain why Channel 4 decided to move forward with that plan? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess to explain fast forward, we need to take a little step back to 2020. So in 2020, we announced our Future 4 strategy. And that strategy was for the first time ever that we were going to prioritize the growth of our digital platform or our VOD platform over linear rating. So this was quite a big thing for us. It was the first time that we approached the business in that way. And we set ourselves some quite ambitious targets then as well. One of those targets was that uh, that at least 30% of all of our revenue would come from the digital side of the business, from, from the streaming platform of the business and advertising sales on that platform. And uh, that target was to be hit by next year and we are firmly on track and we're going to hit that target. <laughs> So we also, um, you know, we're prioritizing the VOD platform in many different ways as well. So, you know, in all decisions that are made for, you know, producing, commissioning content and, um, you know, how we package content, how we, how we make it available to our viewers. In January this year, we took the next step, which was announcing our fast forward strategy, which is supercharging our previous strategy. Our next ambitious target is that by 20. 30, at least 50% of all of our revenue will be coming from the digital side of the business. So this is really significant if you compare it to other, uh, for example, broadcasters in the UK, where still around 10% of their revenue is coming from the VOD side. And, you know, we're hoping to, in the next few years, have 50% of our revenue coming from the VOD side. That's incredible. And I think it's such an exciting space and the whole video on demand and streaming service landscape is obviously rapidly evolving. And Channel 4 plays a critical role in that entire space as a BVOD service. What are your thoughts on the kind of status quo and evolution of the BBOD space and what excites you about the future? Uh, yeah, so as someone who has worked in advertising for over, you know, 20 years now, I've seen the landscape change in so many ways. I've always been attracted, like I said, to whatever the fastest growing new thing is. And as someone who comes from a digital background, I used to be super excited by digital, but now can, what I can see is happening in CTV space, the BVOD space, and this the growth and how you know fast it's moving. That's what's really exciting to me. I think what is very exciting about BVOD is you've got the combination of quality premium content and you've also got scale, and the scale is just so significant. And whenever you're wanting to do anything meaningful with data, you really need scale to deliver that, and BVOD has that scale. Uh, so, so that's really exciting to me and I think that the opportunities with data 
and the Bebop platforms are, you know, they're kind of endless. We're just continually evolving in that space. It's also still early days, but linear over IP or ALA, whatever you whatever you want to call it, uh, that's also the next big exciting thing that we're starting to talk about a lot more. Um, if you combine the scale in the future of linear and people watching linear, but it's delivered over IP and has the capabilities that we can see, the digital capabilities we see on VOD, that's going to be really exciting as well. Yeah, I bet. Lots of work to do and uh, lots of excitement ahead, I'm sure. Uh, and obviously, speaking of that space, obviously, over the last few years, we've seen all the major streaming service providers move from what was purely a kind of a paid subscription model to offering free or uh, discounted ad supported plans. For example, Amazon Prime uh, made that their default position earlier this year. What do you think has brought this about and what makes this model so interesting for all the parties involved? And then finally, how do you see that evolving? Yeah, it's really interesting. Like the first half of this year, you just see so many different platforms offering an AVOB model. Uh, I feel that there are several reasons for this shift and that the movement is actually going both ways. So uh, BVOD platforms traditionally offered free ad-supported content and they're uh, now also looking at offering a combination of both that and maybe a subscription in an ad-free or an ad light version as well. So that includes Channel 4. So we're getting into that space as well. I think this is predominantly because we're learning to uh, deliver what the viewers want. So if users want an, uh, a free ad-supported platform, give them that. If they want an ad light or an ad-free platform, then also give them that option through subscription. Uh, saying that, the shift from SVOD to AVOD is sort of undeniable at the moment, what we've been seeing with the other streamers. And I think this probably down to the undeniable fact that advertising generates significant revenue for publishers. Like it just, you can't deny that and video ads in particular have been the fastest type growing type of advertising in recent years so there's also several times a year where premium video believe it or not premium video uh, ads inventory is is scarce at certain times of year so that also means there's an opportunity there for for more of that inventory to come into the market for advertisers so i think there's a combination of reasons why this is happening and like i said it's going both ways but you can't deny the fact that there are just so, so many revenue opportunities around around these ad supported platforms yeah for sure and obviously you mentioned the kind of the, it's consumer behavior potentially that's driving some of that change and increasingly we are a streaming first consumer um, and much has been written about the slightly now overcrowded streaming space and the potential for future consolidation of either services or simply how you access that content uh, can you talk about what channel 4 is doing in that space for example through services like freely but generate from a content and service perspective what channel 4 is doing to retain its current audience audience but also attract and grow its audience in quite a crowded space. Yeah, absolutely. So we're very much watching, especially what younger audiences are doing at the moment because their viewing habits are so different to, to previous generations. Uh, I think that we are approaching this in so many different ways. So the fast forward strategy, as we've talked about, is looking at definitely prioritizing our Channel 4 streaming platform over our linear platform. It does, it's not necessarily um, saying the focus is not still on the linear side, but the linear side is also changing we have, for example, uh, our ALA uh, offering or what will be uh, linear over IP, and that's part of that freely uh, relationship that we're going to have where linear viewers can now be accessing Channel 4 linear but over delivered over IP, and that will have these enhanced capabilities in the future. So that's going to be an interesting space. But also younger audiences, uh, they are going to destinations to watch content that are changing from, you know, from how people have in the past. YouTube is is undeniably in a place where younger viewers go to watch content. So for us to address that, we, over the last couple of years, have had just a really strong social strategy. We uh, grew on, we built on our relationship with Google's YouTube and we have given them thousands of hours of long form content, which both Google and Channel 4 can monetize. And we also have launched a bespoke channel, Channel 4.0, that's Channel 4 content that lives only on YouTube. So there's ways that we are addressing this change in viewing habits and it's just going to be a really interesting area to watch over the next few years to see how 
you know, all of the different platforms approach that that change. Yeah, that's fascinating. And obviously it's it's embracing what social has to offer. Uh, and for anyone that doesn't follow the Channel 4 social account on Threads, they are doing a fantastic job. I'm a big fan of the work that that team's doing on Threads. I just think Amazing. it's a really, <laughs> great channel for you. Great channel. Uh, yeah. One of our most downloaded case studies from infosum.com is a case study focused on the work that Channel 4 and Nectar 360 have done in the retail media space. And obviously you mentioned the retail product a little bit earlier on. Can you give us an overview of that retail media solution for anyone who might not be familiar with it? And secondly, just give us an update on how that product has been performing since launching, I think, in early 2023 or late 2022. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So I think we went live with our test campaigns in maybe January last December, December of the year before or January last year in 2023. So we're in our second full year of our relationship with Nectar 360. How that came about was when we had launched Brand Match and we'd take it out to market, we had loads of brands that were super interested, but some brands and one of our biggest verticals was retailers or sorry, FMCG clients who didn't have their um, own first party data. So they approached us really wanting to get involved in some kind of data pairing you know, relationship. And that's where we realized there were opportunities with the different retailers and their loyalty programs. So the first partnership we went into was with Nectar 360. And what we did was we matched their millions of uh, lo- loyalty card uh, customers with our 30 million registered users. And we created you know, hundreds of segments immediately. Oh, and it was purely based on recent shopper activity of Nectar customers. So now an advertiser could come to us, an FM, FMCG customer could come to us and say, I would like to target my um, uh, my customers who have recently shopped in a Sainsbury's with a new uh, product release and we can sell them that category that they actually, uh, that their product exists in. So for example, Walker's Crisps could buy a segment of people who've bought crisps in the last four to eight weeks. And we can target them with the new product ad. And then post campaign, we can also then measure using the InfoSum clean room system. We can also measure whether people who saw the ad also went on to buy that product or, you know, bought bought something in the family or the product itself. So we've We're very proud of this retail offering. It's been a huge success. It's been a reputational success, but it's also been physically, you know, revenue-wise, it's been a success for us as well, Um, to the point where we have now launched the partnership also with Tesco Club Card and uh, with with Boots, with their loyalty program as well. So that's just really offering advertisers something that they were asking for, which is a, a data solution when they didn't have their own data. Yeah, for sure. Give them what they want, I guess, is the uh, is is the line there for sure. Uh, and it's an incredibly exciting proposition and it's seen fantastic results. As we mentioned, we will put a link to the case study in the description of this podcast and I'd encourage people to download it and take a look um, at its performance because it's been quite incredible. We've touched on a few times, obviously, that our industry is changing at a rapid pace and that's something that excites you and you love seeing kind of the next thing. So what are some of the things that excite you about the industry and where we're headed right now? Um, I definitely think, as I've mentioned, when we see the growth of linear delivery over IP, so there'll be something definitely to watch that's going to be really exciting. Uh, And I also really, what I'm really excited about at the moment is the breaking down of barriers. Uh, There's this, and and like the emergence of these new relationships and partnerships uh, between companies that previously were competitors and, you know, now they're emerging maybe a bit more as frenemies. Uh, so you've got these different partnerships taking place, which um, making make, making it that advertisers are getting what they want, viewers get, are getting what they want, but also both the businesses are, you know, enab- through this partnership able to grow. So in some ways we're seeing that definitely, for example, with our relationship, Channel 4, with Google and YouTube, uh, breaking down the barriers there and becoming partners in terms of content and also in ad sales and I think you're really going to see a lot more of that uh, definitely cross-broadcaster collaboration when it comes to measurement especially and you know ideally I'd love to see being able to find one unique user across you know through InfoSum but across all the different broadcasters and then measuring uh, the attribution off the back of that as well so yeah the breaking down of barriers I think in this the new world is something that I'm really excited about and I see a lot of opportunity happening there. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. And I think there's just so much potential for the future and there's an incredibly exciting uh, time ahead of us. Uh, 
I want to appreciate so much you being on this podcast. And as you know, this podcast is about individuals who, like yourself, who have pioneered new ways to use data to deliver better customer experiences. So when you look at people that you admire in the industry, who would you nominate for me to interview in an upcoming episode? I definitely think that retail media is such an interesting, fast-growing space. So for me, I think uh, one of the next interviews could definitely be from a mover, mover and shaker in the retail media space. Uh, we have worked a lot with Kiara Schmidt uh, over at Tesco Dunhumby and also Alice Anton from Nectar360. So those, those are people I think I'd like to hear from. Yeah, both fantastic people. We will definitely reach out to them and get them on a future episode of Identity Architects. Alex, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for all you do. Um, I appreciate you so much. I'm someone that didn't come from the advertising industry before I joined Infosum, and you were one of the first people that I got to meet in the media industry. And now I see you at events, a friendly face, a smiley face, always happy and always with a hello. Uh, so I, on a personal level, just really appreciate you. Uh, and appreciate the relationship we have with Channel 4. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you so much, Ben. Love working with InfoSum and thank you so much for having me on this podcast. It's been fantastic. Thanks again to Alex for joining me on the podcast. I loved that conversation and it was great to get such interesting insight into Channel 4's approach to CTV, the landscape as a whole and its ambitions for the future. All that leaves for me to do is to remind you to hit that subscribe button so you'll know when the next episode of Identity Architects lands. But until then, thanks for listening.